baptism is the way that God makes one person part of a covenant people, then we can arrive at a completely different conclusion, and that is that baptism, therefore, is a proper for infants and children as well as for adults. But the amount of knowledge that an individual has is not as necessary as the uh, correct form uh, being uh, performed so that God acts the way he has promised to. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures that will uh, help you, I hope, uh, put you on good footing apologetically for where the church uh, is coming from on this issue. The first is Colossians uh, chapter 2. There is a pew Bible. I'd like you to turn to that. Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. This, in fact, goes back to the conversation we were having at lunch today regarding the difference between dispensational teaching and uh, you might call it covenant uh, teaching, uh, which is the, uh, the way that the church has interpreted Scripture through most of its history. Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. And ye, the Christians, are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, so here, when, uh, right off the bat, we know when he says principality and power, he's talking about a spiritual state. Remember, we are already seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And Paul does make mention of principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So he's talking about a spiritual reality here. Verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands. So we've been circumcised with a spiritual circumcision. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now what is this circumcision? Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the operation, through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. The central tenet of the church has been that God has a covenant people on the earth. And the name of that covenant people is Israel. And the way that one becomes a part of the covenant people is through circumcision. It's plainly taught in the Old Testament. And here it's plainly taught in the New Testament that our baptism constitutes our circumcision because we are connected through Christ. Uh, Verse 13, You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So this isn't the circumcision of the law of Moses, Rather, it is the circumcision of Christ, which we receive in baptism, for giving us our sin, blotting out the handwriting against us. Verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he brings it back to the spiritual, he's talking about spiritual things. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And this this is another thing I'm going to cover in a few moments. Uh, the second verse is Philippians 3, 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Just to reinforce this. Who is the church? What are we? Philippians 3, 3. We are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The plainest verse regarding who is the Israel of God. We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Rather, uh, he might have said, and have no confidence in our uh, Jewish ancestry. 
So, baptism we saw in Colossians is connected with circumcision. And that we are the circumcision and therefore the Israel of God. And of course, Lester mentioned uh, uh, the verses in Galatians which approve that. So to understand the work of God in baptism, the place you begin is to understand the work of God in circumcision in the Old Testament. Now why did baptism uh, replace circumcision? To understand that, we have to go back to uh, John the Baptist. We have to understand what it meant to a Jew of the first century to be baptized. If you and I had lived at that time as Gentiles and we began attending a synagogue and we began praying and we began seeking after the God of Israel, the one true God, in the synagogue. We would not be part, uh, they, would, they didn't have open communion. <laughs> we wouldn't be part of the covenant people. We would be Gentiles. And our ancestry meant that we had generation after generation of pagan worship. We were unclean, uh, filthy pagans. And they, the name for a Gentile who was going through this search for God was called a God-fearer. You can find references in Paul's letters to those who fear God. That is, the Gentiles in the synagogues who were studying the Israelite religion and coming to a faith in the God of the Bible. If we had come to the place where we were fully converted, and let's assume we were men, the first step in becoming a part of the covenant people for a Gentile was to be baptized. The baptism was the sign, the sacrament, if you will, of one's cleansing away of generation after generation of pagan worship. It was the cleansing away of sin. It was the cleansing away of all of the things that made Gentiles unclean so that you came out of the baptismal waters ready to receive the covenant. You were prepared. You no longer had that that heathenistic background. You were clean. You were a new person. And then you were circumcised, which would have been a challenge if we had done this as adults. And then we were considered part of the covenant people. Now where have you heard this before? You, you hear it all. You, this, this is exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus. You must be born again of water and of the Spirit. You see, what John the Baptist did that was so revolutionary was that he went to the Jews and he said, You have left the faith so much and you have sinned so badly that you are worth nothing but a bunch of what... Of what a bunch of Gentiles would be worth. You have just as much spiritual filth on you as the Greeks and Romans. So you have to start all over again just as if you were a Gentile.